First up is the Summon Golem Bell. What might seem like a fun item in the Gauntlet of Shar and completely useless afterwards is probably one of the most overpowered items in Baldur's Gate 3. By using this item in combat, you're able to activate item effects that require a dash or other similar action, which this bell somehow qualifies as. Items such as the Boots of Arcane Bolstering, the Speedy Light Feet, Spring Step Boots, Fleet Fingers, and Line Breaker Boots all have bonuses that you can activate by using this bell in combat, and the best part is that using the bell does not require an action nor bonus action at all. It's completely free to spam. This is particularly broken on line breaker boots because you can use the bell repeatedly to max out your stacks of wrath, which increases your melee damage with each stack, or even better, use the bell with the boots of arcane bolstering for arcane charges, which makes you deal bonus damage equal to your proficiency bonus on each source of damage you deal. This is extremely broken on a magic missile build or really any build that tries to maximize the number of sources of damage to get the most out of the arcane charges. You can be given the summon golem bell from Balthazar in the Gauntlet of Shar within Act 2 by asking him for help. And if you like that tip, don't forget to smash that like button and subscribe for more Baldur's Gate 3 videos. Next up is the Diadem of Arcane Synergy. This rare circlet grants arcane synergy when the wearer inflicts a condition. Arcane Synergy causes weapon attacks to deal additional damage equal to the affected entity's spell casting ability modifier. And what makes this circlet so powerful is that it seems to activate on almost anything. By simply moving into melee range, you apply the threatened condition, which activates the circlet. Any type of attack, even if it misses, somehow activates it. Even thinking about the item activates it. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding on that one. You can find the Diadem of Arcane Synergy on Ardent Jet Rezath in the Inquisitor's Chamber chamber in Crush Yellick during Act 1, and it is definitely one of the most powerful circlets I have ever seen. Next up is the Big Boy's Chew Toy. This quarterstaff might not look impressive at first glance because it doesn't really have any passive benefits that justify using it for an extended period of time, but it does have a spell on it called Who's a Large Fellow that makes this quarterstaff a must. Who's a Large Fellow grants a plus 1d4 damage bonus to weapon attacks and grants advantage on strength checks and saving throws. Rows. So you can cast Who's a Large Fellow and then switch to your main weapon and keep the benefits for 10 turns. This is perfect for using right before a big boss fight or a tough encounter. The plus 1d4 damage is per attack or throw and will get multiplied on a critical hit, so what might look insignificant can really add up to meaningful damage over the course of 10 turns. You can buy the Big Boy's Chew Toy from Land Tarv on the ground floor of Moonrise Towers during Act 2. Next up is the Drake Throat Glaive. The Drake Throat Glaive, like the Big Boy's Chew Toy, is another weapon that provides a buff and then can be swapped for a better weapon. This buff is called Draconic Elemental Weapon and lasts until long rest. It enchants a weapon to deal an additional 1d4 elemental damage of your choice. The weapon you cast this on is also imbued with a plus one bonus to attack and damage rolls, so it's actually a pretty awesome spell. Top it all off with the fact that Draconic Elemental Weapon can be twin casted on two different weapons, and this weapon is really carrying its weight way more than you might think when you first see it. An absolute must, in my opinion. You can buy the Drake Throat Glaive from Roa Moonglow on the ground floor of Moonrise Towers during Act 2. And next up is the Dark Fire Shortbow, one of my favorites. The Dark Fire Shortbow is another amazing item that makes up for lacking any sort of extra damaging ability with really powerful utility. This shortbow grants resistance to both fire and cold damage and grants the ability to cast Haste. Haste is one of the strongest spells in the game, allowing the target of this spell to gain plus two to armor class, advantage on dexterity saving throws, its movement speed doubled, and most importantly, an extra action per turn. Now in a class that can attack three or more times per action, this is a really powerful spell. And you can even twin cast it, making two party members have haste, which really maximizes the value of this shortbow. You can buy this shortbow off Damon in the Last Light in Stables during Act to. And next up is Falar Aluv. This incredible sword can cast two melodies, Sing or Shriek. Sing causes all allies within six meters to have a 1d4 bonus to attack rolls and charisma, wisdom, and intelligence saving throws. And while this is strong, it doesn't compare to the awesome power of Shriek. Shriek causes all enemies within six meters to have a 1d4 penalty to charisma, wisdom, and intelligence saving throws, and receive an extra 1d4 
thunder damage. This 1d4 thunder damage is added to each source of damage, meaning builds that release a flurry of attacks like magic missile, scorching ray, or even a thrower who maybe throws six times a turn, or a dual hand crossbow gloomstalker who attacks six plus times per turn, can make Falar Aloof provide an absolutely massive amount of bonus damage for your entire party. This thunder damage even synergizes with items like the Ring of Spiteful Thunder, causing daze to creatures that are already reverberating, and with all the possible synergies that come with Falar Aloof, it is probably one of the most overpowered weapons in the entire game. You can find Falar Aloof in the Underdark, lodged within a rock, similar to Excalibur. To remove it, you'll need to either pass a Strength or Religion check, unless you are a Cleric of Elastray, in which case you can remove the sword without an ability check. And next up is the Lightning Jabber. This spear might not seem very special at first, especially since you can find more than one, so it's not very unique, but it is actually one of the best throwing weapons in the entire game, only surpassed by the Dwarven Thrower being thrown by a Dwarf. That's because this spear deals 1d4 lightning damage when thrown, but unlike weapons that are meant to be thrown, the Lightning Jabber doesn't have homing weapon, meaning it doesn't automatically return to you. So it's made specifically for Eldritch Knights who can bind the weapon so it returns to them once thrown. So most players will probably see this and think, ah, oh, it's really not all that great since it doesn't return to you once thrown, so maybe I'll just throw it once and then just leave it there. And on top of that, it's actually pretty well hidden. You can only find the Lightning Jabber off the Kuatoa Chief, northeast of the Grand Mausoleum entrance in Act 2, down by the water. But if you do pick it up and use it for a thrower build, you will be pleasantly surprised. And next up is the Staff of Arcane Blessing. This staff provides Mistress Blessing, which grants Bless an additional 1d4 to saving throws and weapon attack rolls, an additional 2d4 to spell attack rolls. Since Bless already provides a plus 1d4 bonus to attack rolls and saving throws, this spell makes Bless incredibly powerful, especially when using feats like Great Weapon Master or Sharpshooter, which lower your attack rolls. The Whispering Promise is a ring that gives Bless when healing, and if you wear this staff at the same time, unfortunately, that does not cause Mistress Blessing as well, but that would be even more overpowered. However, this staff is still really powerful for the bonus to Bless because Bless is already so strong, and using the Staff of Arcane Blessing just pushes that to the next level. And next up is Envoy's Amulet. This is one of my favorites. This hidden gem is one of my favorites because it requires you to really help the Myconid colony, first with the Dwergars, and then eventually defeat Nier, or Nair, and bring his head back to the Sovereign of the Myconid colony. I like this in particular because you get to carry around a drow head covered with mushrooms at the end. Really think that's fun. However, if you turn it into Spa, then you get this amulet, the Envoy's amulet. But if you turn it into Glut, you'll actually get the Champion's Chain. These are two distinct items, and both of them are somewhat similar though. They grant either plus two to Persuasion or Intimidation, depending on which one you choose. Now, it's not the most powerful item in the game, but getting a plus two to a high DC Persuasion or Intimidation check really could make all the difference for you. And once you use it, you can just switch one of your companions to a different amulet. So it can be really handy for that one roll that might be super difficult to help you win it and make it through that dialogue successfully. Any other underrated items you can think of? Let me know in the comments and I'll see you in the next video. Take care.